Western Europe, 1917. After three years of grueling combat, the First World War has become a struggle of attrition. From the mountains of Switzerland to the lowlands of Belgium, the Western Front now stretches over 600 kilometers. At this point in the war, the Central and Allied powers have sustained millions of casualties and the war is showing no sign of coming to an end. In the spring of 1917, the French and British plan a new offensive in the hope of ending this stalemate. The operation would come to be known as the Battle of Arras, involving over 158,000 troops. Three of the armies of the British Expeditionary Force would conduct operations along an 18km front. The 5th Army would conduct a push south of Arras, while the 3rd Army would be fighting the German on the outskirts of the city itself. As for the 1st Army, composed of the Canadian Corps, they would be tasked with taking Vimy Ridge, an objective considered virtually impregnable. Vimy Ridge is a prominent feature of approximately 8 kilometers in length and 145 meters in height running north to south. It is the highest point in the area, giving whoever owns it an unobstructed view of tens of kilometers in all directions. Vimy Ridge represented a vital terrain for both the Allied and Central forces. As one Canadian observer noted at the time, more of the war could be seen atop Vimy Ridge than from any other place in France. Furthermore, attacking the ridge would help divert German resources from the assault on Arras. In March, the 1st Army Headquarters presents Lieutenant General Bing, the commander of the Canadian Corps, with orders outlining Vimy Ridge as the objective for the Battle of Arras. For the first time in the war, the four Canadian divisions of the Canadian Corps would fight together. Although the Canadian Corps was comprised of multiple units and formations, both British and Canadian, its main maneuver elements were four specific divisions. The 1st Canadian Division, commanded by Major General Arthur Curry. The 2nd Canadian Division, commanded by Major General Henry Burstall. The 3rd Canadian Division, commanded by Major General Louis Lipset. And the 4th Canadian Division, commanded by Major General David Watson. An assault plan is created that draws heavily on the lessons learned from the Battle of Verdun. The Battle of Verdun had been won in part due to a massive bombardment campaign that was carefully coordinated with the movement of frontline troops. The Canadian Corps' divisions would be divided along four axes of advance centered on the village of Vimy. Each of the four Canadian divisions would be assigned a specific corridor, with the 1st Division on the southern flank, followed by the 2nd Division, then the 3rd, and finally the 4th Division on the northern flank. The Canadian would begin their advance on the outskirts of the village of Neuville and progress east up Vimy Ridge in order to capture the four different objectives. The first of these objectives was the Black Line. According to British intelligence, the Black Line would be the most difficult objective to capture as it represented the heavily fortified German First Line. The second objective, known as the Red Line, would consist of the highest point on the ridge and a foothold on the outskirts of the village of Thelis. This would be the final objective of the 3rd and 4th Division. The third objective, referred to as the Blue Line, consisted of securing Hill 135 and the village of Thelis. The last objective, or the Brown Line, would consist of capturing the rest of the ridge and the German second line. The execution of the battle would draw heavily on the support of the artillery. With their heavy and medium howitzers, they would provide a creeping barrage of indirect fire followed closely by the infantry. The barrage would advance in increments of 100 yards every 3 minutes. If the Corps maintained its schedule, the troops would advance as much as 3.7 kilometers and have the majority of the ridge under control by 1 p.m. on the first day. Facing the Canadians was the 1st Bavarian Reserve Corps led by General Fassbender. Three divisions comprising of seven infantry regiments were responsible for the immediate defense of the ridge. These divisions were positioned along well-fortified trenches overlooking the Canadians to the west. General Fassbender's intent was to maintain a front line robust enough to defend against an initial assault and then move his reserves forward before the enemy can consolidate their gains. As a result, the German defenses at Vimy Ridge relied heavily on machine guns which acted as a force multiplier for the defending infantry. At the start of World War I, the typical defensive position was composed of a complex series of trenches. These trench lines were made up of multiple components, the first part being the obstacle plan. Located at the front of the trench line, the obstacle plan was constructed out of barbed wire. Its purpose was to block and canalize the enemy into pre-designated kill zones, meaning an area into which a concentration of firepower could be delivered using machine guns and artillery. The next section was the frontline trench, also known as the fire trench. Most of the killing and the being killed would take place in these trenches. The support trench provided a second line of defense in case the frontline trench was overrun. 
they also contain the machine gun nests that were usually manned by three to four soldiers. The reserve line was where the reserve units were being kept. Their purpose was to reinforce the first two trenches. Finally, all trenches were interconnected by passages called communication trenches. In December 1916, following the Battle of the Somme, General Ludendorff published a new defensive doctrine. This doctrine specifically emphasized the importance of utilizing depth during defensive operations in order to increase flexibility and maneuver. This could be achieved by building fortifications in depth instead of focusing on fortifying the front lines. However, General Fassbender, the commander of the 1st Bavarian Corps, would spend two years leading up to the battle fortifying his front lines. Compounding his poor decision was the fact that General Fassbender was only able to field 60% of his troops at the time. Due to a lack of resources and the recent German losses, the division now had approximately 9,000 soldiers instead of 15,000. Additionally, for reasons unknown, General Fassbender places his reserves 24 kilometers behind his main defensive position. A few months prior to the battle, the Canadians are staged in an area to the west of the ridge. Under the cover of darkness, the Canadian Corps regularly rehearses the execution of the assault on the ridge, as well as conduct reconnaissance patrol across German lines to harass, capture prisoners, and gather intelligence. During the day, a massive logistical operation was taking place. Thousands of tons of food, guns, munition, personnel, and other supplies were being hauled to the front lines. British biplanes could also be seen screening the area for German batteries and enemy strong points. Perhaps the most important work leading up to the battle was the secret construction of 11 tunnels. These tunnels were designed to bring the assault force directly to the front of the German lines, bypassing no man's land and avoiding unnecessary casualties. Each tunnel was equipped with electric lighting, water supplies, first aid station, as well as chambers for battalion command posts. Meanwhile, the 1st Bavarian Corps would conduct their own intelligence gathering and would soon deduct that a spring offensive in the area was being prepared. Their suspicions would be confirmed when a German-born Canadian soldier deserts the Canadian Corps and joins the German forces. By early March 1917, the Central Powers knew that an offensive was imminent and would include an operation aimed at capturing Vimy Ridge. On March 20th, 1917, preliminary actions are taken by the Canadians to start shaping the battlefield to their advantage. The Canadian Corps starts a massive bombardment operation against the Germans. Only half of the artillery fires at once, and the intensity of the barrage is varied to confuse the Germans about Canadian intentions. Furthermore, the German obstacle plan comprised of barbed wire across the position is targeted by the artillery. A special round known as the 106 instantaneous fuse is used to make the task easier. This new technology gave the Canadians the ability of detonating high explosive shells above the ground surface instead of below. On April 2nd, the Canadian Corps increases the intensity of the indirect fire. The German soldiers will later refer to this week as the week of suffering. In the German account, their trenches and defensive positions were almost demolished. The health and morale of the German troops suffered immensely. Compounding this issue was the effect the artillery was having on the lines of communication and logistics sustainment plan. The German forces were now unable to effectively bring rations and supplies to their front lines. From the 8th to the 9th of April, the artillery bombardment continues throughout the night and then stops shortly before the attack. At 5.30 a.m., every artillery piece begins firing on the ridge, enough to cover every 18 meters of the ridge. 30 seconds later, Canadian engineers detonate powerful mine charges that have been laid under no man's land and the German trench line, instantaneously destroying several German strongpoints. The field guns fire a barrage that advances at a rate of 100 yards per 3 minutes. This barrage is followed closely by the Canadian infantry that is using it as a form of covering movement. At 6.25 am, the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Canadian divisions have reached the black line, their first objective. Meanwhile, on the northern flank, the 4th Canadian Division, tasked with taking Hill 145, the highest point on the ridge, is pinned down by effective machine gun fire coming from the Pimple. The Pimple was located north of Hill 145 and was one of the most fortified strong points of the area, with an excellent field of view on the Canadian troops. The pre-assault bombardment had not done enough damage to those German positions. As a result, only minutes into the assault, the leading waves of the 4th Canadian Division come under fire and were cut down. After having consolidated on the black line, the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Canadian Division resumed the advance. 
Shortly after 7 a.m., the 1st and 2nd Canadian Divisions have captured the Red Line. At 7.30 a.m., shortly after the detonation of a mine that neutralizes a German infantry regiment, the southern section of the 3rd Canadian Division is able to reach the Red Line. At 9 a.m., the situation on the northern flank is dire. The 4th Canadian Division is reporting high rates of casualties and is now no longer covered by the creep and bombardment of the artillery. At this point, Major General Watson, commander of the 4th Division, commits his reserves. At 11 a.m., the leading elements of the 4th Canadian Divisions are reinforced by reserve units and mount another attack against the German positions. German troops holding the southwestern portion of the Hill 145 are forced to withdraw up the hill as they are running low on ammunition and supplies. Around 6 p.m., elements of the German forces muster a counterattack against the 3rd Canadian Division to regain their third line. Although they are able to clear the ruined village of Vimy, they are ultimately unable to recapture their positions on the ridge. The following day, on April 10, 9.30 a.m., the 1st and 2nd Canadian Divisions are reinforced by three brigades, including two sections of tanks. At 11 a.m., the Blue Line, including Hill 135, and the village Thelis are captured by the 1st and 2nd Canadian Division. To permit the troops time to consolidate on the Blue Line, the advance stops and the barrage remains stationary for 90 minutes while machine guns are brought forward. At 2 p.m., the Canadian 1st and 2nd Divisions have secured the Brown Line, their final objective. 3.15 p.m. on the northern flank, the 4th Canadian Division is briefly able to capture the peak of Hill 145 before a German counterattack eventually retakes the position. By nightfall, with no prospect of reinforcement and dwindling supplies, the German forces on Hill 145 are forced to withdraw the position. The Pimple is now the only remaining Canadian objective not yet captured. On the last day of the operation, on April 12th, at 4 a.m., the Canadian Corps mounts an attack on the Pimple, but are repelled by the Germans. An hour later, this time with artillery support, the 4th Canadian Division mounts another attack on the German positions. Thanks to the well-coordinated artillery fire and a snowstorm that is now blowing east in effect and visibility, the Canadians are able to exploit wide gaps and break into the German positions. By nightfall, on April 12, 1917, the Canadian Corps has finally captured the Pimple, and seize Vimy Ridge. In the aftermath of the battle, 980 artillery piece would have fired more than a million shells on the German positions for a duration of two weeks. The 1st Bavarian Corps would suffer more than 20,000 casualties, including 4,000 men becoming prisoners of war. Following the German defeat, an investigation on the collapse of the defenses ordered by the German general staff. The court concludes in part that the leadership had failed to implement the new defensive doctrine. As a result, numerous German generals would be severely reprimanded for their failures before the end of the war. The Canadian Corps would suffer over 10,000 casualties, 3,598 killed and over 7,000 wounded. Four members of the Canadian Corps would later receive the Victoria Cross for their actions the highest military decoration awarded to the British and Commonwealth forces. Thanks to the implementation of new tactics, superior coordination of indirect fire, along with meticulous planning and preparation, the victory at the Battle of Vimy Ridge would help the Allied powers achieve the longest advance into German-held territory since the beginning of the war, surpassing the record set by the French at the Battle of the Somme. After Vimy Ridge, the 1st Canadian Corps would gain the reputation of an elite fighting force and continue dominating the battlefield until the capitulation of the German Empire in 1918. Although most of the units comprising the Canadian Corps were disbanded following World War I, a few still exist today, most notably the Royal 22nd Regiment, known as the Van Dues, who fought with the 2nd Division during the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the Princess Patricia's Light Infantry Regiment, and the Royal Canadian Regiment who both fought with the 3rd Division. Today, the Canadian National Vimy Memorial, a monument dedicated to the memory of the Canadian Corps member who died during the First World War, sits on top of Hill 145. The memorial stands as a symbol of national pride for Canada, as well as the embodiment of the Canadian fighting spirit. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing to this channel. Also, feel free to suggest any future topics in the comments below. Thank you for watching.